When people ask me why I don't believe in the Bible, I generally just give a brief overview of reasons coupled with a few examples of those reasons. I generally say that the Bible is unscientific, it's unhistorical, and it's heavily plagiarized from older myths and older legends. It contains obvious fables, it makes supernatural claims which can and have been falsified, and it is self-contradictory. And on top of everything else, it is also extremely immoral. I made a video a few weeks ago where I went over all of that, but today I want to take a completely different approach. Instead of giving a broad overview of all the reasons that I don't believe in the Bible, I want to take a look at a single story from the Bible and explain why, even with just one story, I don't believe in the Bible. Because even if just one story in the Bible is clearly untrue, then I have no reason to believe in the rest of it. Because if the Bible is the Word of God, then all of it must be true, and if any portion of it, no matter how insignificant, can be demonstrated to be unscientific, unhistorical, or contradictory, then that alone is enough to disregard the book entirely. So today, the story that I want to look at is the story of the Tower of Babel. Hey, what's up? I'm Dallas Wade, and welcome back to another worship service. As epic in proportion as the Tower of Babel story is, the story itself is only nine verses long. It starts in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1, and it ends in verse 9. Because the story is so short, I'm going to go ahead and read through the whole thing here. This is the New King James Version, by the way, for those of you who care about that sort of thing. It reads as follows. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And that's it. That's the whole story, just nine verses long. You would think that a story this short couldn't have many problems in it, but it does. In fact, it contains more problems than it does verses. <laughs> An important piece of context in this story is that it takes place just three generations after Noah and his family left the ark. So shortly after the global flood wiped out every living thing with the exception of the eight people and millions of animals that were on Noah's boat. According to Answers in Genesis, the story takes place approximately 100 years after the flood. That isn't a very long time. In Genesis chapter 10, the chapter before Babel, it tells that the sons of Noah begat sons and that their sons begat begat sons, and that their sons begat sons. It never mentions that they begat daughters, but it's safe to assume that they did that as well. The Bible just doesn't think women are important enough to be mentioned. Noah's son Ham begat Cush, Cush begat Nimrod, and Nimrod, presumably when he was an adult, led his inbred family to the land of Shinar, where they built a city and erected the Tower of Babel. So three generations, all begat from three sons and three wives. The big question here is how many people would there have been three generations? later. Creationists like to make the argument that human population grows at a steady rate, which is why they believe that the Earth can't be billions of years old, otherwise there would be more humans than there are electrons in the universe. Creation apologist John Hefner said that the human population growth rate is conservatively 0.456% every year and liberally 1.7% every year. And the growth rate is under one half of one percent. Now we know that to be a verifiable through the data that we do have through the centuries. We can't go back very far, admittedly, but 
it does appear to be under one half a percent average annual growth rate. Yes. Worldwide, it's about 1.7. So this is certainly conservative. Uh, even at that conservative rate, you would get that figure that we demonstrated earlier in the program, 2.45 times 10 to the 990th power. Oh. Answers in Genesis says that conservatively, the human population growth rate doubles every 150 years and liberally every 40 years. Eric Hovind and Kent Hovind have also made this same argument, but I haven't found anywhere that they actually gave their own figures for what they believe the growth rate should be. Well, regardless of what happens in the future, the population today tells us man's only been here about 4,400 years. I'm having a hard time reconciling why is there only 7 billion people on the planet if mankind evolved 3 billion, excuse me, 3 million years ago. If mankind had been here for 3 million years, the human population should have reached 7 billion, what we're at today, 2.9 million years ago, if it only takes 100,000 years. If we use John Hefner's liberal calculation, then there would be a total of 43 people alive during the construction of the Tower of Babel. And if we use the liberal calculation from Answers in Genesis, then there would be a grand total of 48 people alive during the construction of the Tower of Babel. 48 people, and roughly half of them would be children. So approximately 24 adults and 24 children. So according to the math of creation apologists, this is liberally how many people decided to build a stone tower all the way up to heaven, somewhere between 43 and 48 people. If you're going to make the argument that the earth can't be billions of years old because the human population growth rate is consistently growing exponentially, then this is how many people you have after the flood at the time of the story of the Tower of Babel. But even if we throw all of that out the window and are very, very generous and say that maybe the human population tripled every generation, meaning that each couple gave birth to an average of three more couples, and no no one died in that hundred years, then after three generations, you would have a total of 242 people by the time of the Tower of Babel's construction. That still isn't very many people, and keep in mind that eight of these people would be elderly, 72 of them would be adults, and 162 of them would be children. If there were only 72 presumably healthy adults on the planet, do you think they would decide to build a giant stone tower all the way up to heaven? And even if they did, do you think that these people People would be very successful, much less successful enough to make God worried about it. And remember, they have eight elderly people to tend to, along with 162 children. They can't all be building the tower. And also remember, this is only a hundred years after the global flood. All of the vegetation was wiped out, along with almost every animal, and all of the fresh water has been mixed with salt water. So if these people want vegetables to eat, they're going to have to spend a lot of time and effort growing new gardens, planting new trees, and bushes and keeping them from dying. If they want meat to eat, they're going to have to spend a lot of time and effort herding and inbreeding animals and carefully keeping them from going extinct. And if they want water to drink as well as water to give to their plants and animals, they're going to have to spend a lot of time and effort trying to find fresh water sources. And let's not forget that Genesis 11 doesn't just say that they built a tower, it also says that they built an entire city. So even with my very generous calculation, there still wouldn't be enough people to do all of this, especially in the current state of the planet given the biblical context. And if we use Answers in Genesis or John Hefner's liberal calculations, there absolutely would not be enough people to do this. They wouldn't even consider doing something like this. They would be too busy trying to find food and water and tending to all their children. And again, even if they did for whatever reason attempt to build a tower and a city, they couldn't have gotten very far. And certainly not far enough for an all-power for God to be worried about it. Also, why would a God be worried about a tower anyway? What is it going to do? Stand there and be all tall and stuff? Is the tower going to tower over him? And how tall does a tower have to be for an all-powerful God to be worried about it? 100 feet? 200 feet? 1,000 feet? <laughs> If Noah, along with his family and their three sons, along with their respective wives, were the only people on the planet after the flood, and they had children, and their children had children, and then they had children, they would all be heavily inbred, having no other choice but to marry their sibling, their parents, or at best, their cousins or aunts and uncles. How we smells the star.
by the time of the Tower of Babel, there would be very serious side effects from all of the incest. Reduced fertility rates, lower birth rate, higher chances of miscarriages, as well as infant mortality, lowered immune systems, increased chances of genetic disease, and an increase in cognitive defects. This means that the population at the time of the Tower of Babel would likely be significantly lower than the calculations we just went over. And on top of that, it means that humans likely wouldn't have survived for many generations after the flood. Not to mention the same thing happening to literally all of the animals that left Noah's boat. The Bible condemns incest, but at the same time, God both forced and allowed a ton of it to happen. God said that incest was wicked, but at the same time, he also put people in situations where they had no one else to reproduce with, while at the same time, he was telling them to go forth and multiply. There are primarily two ways to interpret the story in Genesis 11, assuming, of course, that you are interpreting it literally. The first is that humans wanted to build a tower all the way up to heaven where God lives. The second is that humans just wanted to build a tower that was so tall that it could be seen from really far away. It all depends on which version of the Bible you're using. The King James Version says a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, implying that they were, in fact, trying to reach the place where God lives. The 1599 Geneva Bible says the same thing. The Aramaic Bible says a tower whose top is in heaven, and it says heaven with a capital H. Surprisingly enough, in the Message Bible, it also says heaven with a capital H. This is explicitly implying that the humans are in fact trying to build a tower up to the place where God lives. But some translations, such as the New Living Translation, just say a tower that reaches into the sky. The Christian Standard Bible, the New American Bible, and the World English Bible Bible also use sky instead of heaven. In these Bibles, it is explicitly implying that the humans are in fact only trying to build a tall tower, and not at all trying to get to the place where God lives. Some translations like the NIV, the ESV, the Amplified Bible, and the New King James Version leave it up for debate by simply using the phrase, the heavens. The heavens could be the sky or the place where God lives. Growing up, I was always taught the first interpretation, that humans wanted to climb all the way up to heaven to be with God. And from my experience, that seems to be the most popular interpretation among Christians. Maybe not universally, but it is at least where I live. But either way you interpret the story, there are major problems with it. The first interpretation, the one that you'll find in the Aramaic Bible or the Message Bible, is just flat out silly. Humans wanted to build a tower so tall that it would physically reach heaven where God lives. But while they were building it, God came down and saw it, and when he saw it, he was worried that if humans could accomplish this, they could literally accomplish anything they wanted. So God said, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will scatter. And he did just that. According to this interpretation, humans are trying to do something impossible right? They want to build a tower tall enough to reach heaven. But heaven, if it does exist, is not in the sky. We know this because we've been to the sky. We have airplanes, helicopters, hot air balloons, zeppelins, jets, and drones constantly flying through the sky. Heaven is not up there. So why would God be worried about it? Why would he try to stop them? If them trying to climb up to heaven was wrong or prideful or sinful, then why not just let them do it since they are doomed to fell? The tower wouldn't reach heaven no matter how tall they made it, and eventually it would collapse in on itself. Their pride would have literally been their downfall. If God didn't live in the sky, there would be no reason for him to be worried. There would be no reason for him to stop the humans from creating their own destruction. However, if God did live in the sky, then he would have a reason to be worried, and he would have a reason to come down and stop them. And the story even suggests that, yes, God did in fact live in the sky. In two separate verses, it says, that God came down to earth, and one of the times it says this, it was God speaking himself. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, come, let us go down there and confuse their language. So yeah, if humans were trying to build a tower that would reach heaven and God came down and stopped them, then the only reasonable explanation is that in this story, in the Bible, God actually did live up in the clouds, which is absolutely bonkers. And and factually, we know that this is not true. If you want to avoid the silly interpretation of Genesis 11, then you could 
subscribe to the interpretation of the New Living Translation or the Christian Standard Bible, where humans were just trying to build a tall tower for no reason other than to keep everyone from scattering across the earth. The humans wanted to establish a city which would hopefully be enough to encourage everyone to stay together and not be divided. Staying together seemed to be the main priority of these humans, which makes sense since there were only like 48 of them on earth according to answers in Genesis. God saw that the humans were building a city and trying to stay together, and this bothered him. He didn't want the humans to be united or to work together, to collaborate. He didn't want the humans to be creative or productive or technologically advanced, so he took it upon himself to confuse their language, that way they wouldn't be able to communicate with one another or work together effectively. And according to the story, it worked. So if we avoid the ridiculous interpretation of the story where the humans are trying to climb into heaven where God lives, then the humans are doing absolutely nothing wrong and God punishes them anyway. He punishes them for working together. He punishes them for trying to stay together and look out for one another. He punishes them for being creative and productive. I've seen where Christians who hold this interpretation say that God punished the humans because they were prideful and arrogant, or even more absurd, that they were committing idolatry. It's the sin of Eve, feeling we don't need to rely on God, we can be God ourselves. So let's build us a tower, let's build us a tower to go on God's level. We don't need to rely on him, we will be like God. Babylon, rebellion, rejection, hatred of God, idolatry. They were making this tower to show everybody how important and great they were. And guess what? God said, wait a minute, I'm more important than them. But these Christians are pulling that reading straight out of their shield. The Bible doesn't say any of those things. That reading of Genesis 11 is entirely unbiblical. In Genesis 6, before God sent the flood, it extensively describes how wicked and evil mankind was. It says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And in Ezekiel 16.49, the Bible extensively describes why the city of Sodom was destroyed. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. But in Genesis 11, the Bible doesn't even suggest that the humans were doing anything wrong at all. If they were prideful, or selfish, or idolaters, or wicked in any way, the Bible would have mentioned it, but it didn't. And not only does the Bible not mention the humans being wicked, but it also explicitly describes why God punished them, and it had nothing to do with selfishness or vanity or idolatry. In verse 6 of chapter 11, the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. God punishes the humans not because they did anything wrong, but because he was scared that if they could unite, build a city together, and be one people and one nation, they would be able to accomplish anything they would be unstoppable. God wanted humankind to be divided. God wanted humankind to be in conflict, to be at war with one another, to hate one another. God wanted mankind to be barbaric, primitive, and unsophisticated, and all because he wanted to protect himself, because he was intimidated and felt threatened by the development and unity of the tiny, feeble, weak, and mortal humans. It's a strange narrative, for sure, but it's right there in your Bible, depending, of course, on which version you're reading. Either God lives in the clouds and the humans are trying to pull a jack and the beanstalk, or the humans are trying to unite and progress as a society and God is a total prick and puts an end to it, which eventually led to wars, genocide, racism, and slavery. <laughs> God is supposed to be all-knowing, right? According to 1 John 3.20, and he's also supposed to be patient, according to 2 Peter 3.9. So why wasn't he in Genesis 11? If God was worried about humans speaking only one language, and if God was worried about humans living together in one city, then he should have just been patient, and he should have known that it was only a matter of time before humans would fix all of those problems for him. There were only 48 people in Babel, according to answers in Genesis, so of course, they 
were going to live together for a while, and of course they were going to be speaking the same language. They were one big, happy, inbred family after all, what do you expect? But eventually, these brothers and sisters would multiply, and there would be more than 48 of them, and inevitably they would outgrow their city, and some of them would want to venture out and explore and find homes elsewhere, and start new families with their favorite sisters. Over time, the humans would scatter, they would become disconnected from one another, they would start their own traditions, their own cultures, and as a result, their vocabulary, their accent, and their style of communication would change. It would grow and shed the old ways, more and more from one generation to the next, and eventually their language would evolve and they would be left with an entirely new and unique dialect. If you study philology, you'll see that most languages have a common ancestor. You can see evidence of this in the languages themselves. It isn't a coincidence that many words in English, French, German, Dutch, and Danish sound similar and look similar. Yeah. In English is Beth. in French and Beth. in Danish. Cal. In English is Who. in German and Who. in Dutch. It's also not a coincidence that people in different regions tend to speak a language that is unique to their region. When people migrate and become more or less isolated to their own country or tribe or island, the language that they take with them evolves over time and it is eventually incomprehensible to the people in the other places who took the same original language with them. Languages evolve and they evolve quickly. Just look at English, for example. We speak different now than people did a hundred years ago. <laughs> if we traveled back in time, we could easily carry on a conversation with someone from a hundred years ago, but they would probably use words and phrases that we no longer use, and we would probably use words and phrases that hadn't yet been invented. <laughs> if we traveled back in time 400 years, we would begin to struggle communicating. We could probably understand them well enough, but they might have a harder time following what we were trying trying to say. To get an idea of English 400 years ago, read some of Shakespeare's original writings. If we traveled back in time a thousand years, we would no longer be able to communicate with the English speakers of that time. To get an idea of how this conversation would go, try reading Beowulf in its original Old English. Language evolves over time, and because of this, if two groups of people take the same language to different countries, and their communication back and forth is very little or none at all, then over time their language will evolve differently, until eventually they are two different languages entirely. This is why we have so many languages. Most of them, if not all of them, came from the same original proto-language, but people scattered, and their communication with one another was limited, and in some cases completely absent. So back to my original point. If God wanted people to scatter and to speak different languages, all he had to do was wait. It would have happened eventually, and sooner rather than later. Plus, isn't a thousand years for us just a day for God, according to 2 Peter 3, 8? He could have just waited a day and there'd be dozens and dozens of languages. Changing the languages and scattering the people was completely unnecessary. It was redundant. It was bound to happen. It was inevitable. No divine intervention was necessary. And an omnipotent, omniscient, all-knowing God should have known that. Is God the author of confusion, or is he not? He can't be both, but according to the Bible, he is. In Genesis 11, when God speaks to the angels or the other gods or whoever it is that he's talking to, he says in verse 7, Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. And verse 8 and 9 go on to say, So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. So God confused mankind, literally the entire planet, every living human being, all 48 of them. He very literally authored the confusion because he personally created the languages and distributed them to all the 48 people that were alive at that time. So God is the author of confusion, 
according to the Bible, but also according to the Bible, God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. This is an obvious contradiction. Not only the bit about him not being the author of confusion, but also the bit about him being a God of peace. The humans had peace, but God didn't like it, so he created strife and conflict. God is not the author of confusion, and he also is the author of confusion. God is a God of peace, and he is also a God of strife and conflict. Those are blatant contradictions. <laughs> Looking at the Tower of Babel story now from a modern perspective is pretty funny. God was so worried about 48 humans trying to build a city and a tower out of rocks. Now there are 8 billion people. We have iron, we have steel, and we've built giant cities with thousands of buildings and millions of people and skyscrapers as tall as 2,700 feet. Accomplishments that Nimrod could have only dreamt of. In our exploration, isn't limited by our tallest structures. We've created airplanes, we have space stations orbiting the planet, we've been to the moon, and we've sent spacecraft beyond our own solar system. These are accomplishments that Nimrod could have never even dreamt of. But God was worried about Nimrod and the ancient people of Shinar stacking rocks on top of one another. If slapping rocks together was alarming enough for God to intervene, then where was he when the right brothers built the first airplane? Where was he during the Apollo moon mission? Where was he when the Voyager 1 left the solar system? Either he doesn't exist, or he just happened to be AFK. <laughs> The other reason God confused the language in the story was to divide humankind geographically and to keep us from understanding one another. But both of those plans have utterly failed. Yes, humans are spread across the planet, but now more than ever, that isn't really an obstacle. We have trains, cars, boats, and airplanes. If you want to get anywhere on the planet, you can be there as late as next week. And if you want to talk to someone on the other side of the planet, it, you don't even have to go there. You can call them, text them, or video chat with them. And you can do that right now. You don't even have to wait for it. We are virtually every bit as connected now as the ancient people of Shinar were, despite there being 8 billion of us and despite us being spread across the entire globe. Also, the language barrier isn't much of a barrier. It never has been, and it certainly isn't now. Was God not aware that people can learn to speak more than one language? And now, it's easier than ever. You can sit in the comfort of your own home and learn new languages, thanks to a number of websites that I will not mention because they haven't reached out to sponsor me yet. Also, even if you don't learn a new language, you can still download free apps to your phone that can translate text and speech in real time. Every single thing that God sought to accomplish in the Tower of Babel story has failed, and failed miserably, embarrassingly. So after it's all said and done, what is the conclusion? What is the conclusion of this story? Is the God of the Bible a real God who is incompetent, has contradicting qualities, lives in the clouds, and hates human progress? Or is this story nothing but a story, a fable, a myth, and not a historical event? Obviously, the story of the Tower of Babel is nothing but a myth. Thousands of years ago, people used to sit around and tell stories trying to explain how we got here, why things are the way that they are, and what is right and wrong. The story of the Tower of Babel is one of those stories. Ancient people noticed that different people in different places spoke different languages, and so they created a story to explain that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Those people weren't stupid, they weren't idiots, they just didn't have access to the vast wealth of information that we do now now. It's a privilege. Ancient people weren't stupid for believing that a god created all of the languages and put them where they are now. But if you believe that, despite all of the information that we have showing otherwise, then you know, that's pretty silly. 
Don't forget to like, comment, and share. Also subscribe and activate that little bell icon if you haven't already. Go follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook if you'd like to keep up with me behind the scenes. And if you'd like to help support what I do, you can pledge to my Patreon or leave me a tip on Cash App. Links and information for all of that stuff is in the description down below. Thank you for all of your support, and I'll see you in the next worship service. Ah!